And next to Oliver, we have the co-author, Peter Kuznick. <laughs> Writer, Jonathan Schell. <laughs> Historian, Douglas Brinkley. <laughs> and editor of the nation, Katrina Van Den Weichel. Start off at asking Katrina Douglas and uh, Jonathan to each speak for five minutes just about the film, their reaction to seeing it now, and maybe if you could include something that you learned, something that you didn't know before you saw these three hours. First of all, what an extraordinary, extraordinary series, and we've only seen three. Uh, so thank you to Peter and Oliver. Um, I feel, I can't speak for my compatriots to my right, but I feel speechless after watching that last hour, but let me try to say a few words. Um, first of all, because it closed with Henry Wallace, and part of the value, power of the film is to bring to bear those who have been written out of our history in many ways, or written out in terms of what they actually, their politics, their values. But I do think that the Wallace, Henry Wallace is having the last laugh because if you go to Hyde Park today, I don't know if you know this, but because of that Monsanto sale, there is a beautiful Henry Wallace Visitor Center uh, just a few hundred yards from Hyde Park. So somewhere Eleanor and Franklin are there with Henry Wallace, and people, young people who come to Hyde Park learn about who Henry Wallace was. I just wanted to say that this is unknown history, and the power of it for a younger generation, I can only imagine as they turn. But you know, at The Nation, um, where I feel I've sometimes been for 147 years since it was founded by abolitionists in 1865, so much of what I saw today is part of what we try to do uh, day in, day out, is to challenge uh, the orthodoxy, challenge the conformity of our history, and to speak truth to power, uh, and to bring to bear history that has either been suppressed or whitewashed. And to do it through free thinkers, through dissenters, always in the belief that perhaps the highest form of patriotism is the right of dissent. And Jonathan Schell, my colleague, fully remembers as this country went to war against Iraq. And that history is so important that we saw because it helps us understand the militarism that so fiercely underlies our politics. The fog of national security, the fog of war, overlay Washington and overlay much of the media, which was afraid to speak independently and never was an independent media more needed. But criticizing a government in a time of war is not a path to popularity, as we saw and I'm sure we will see more in the next segments. And so the old chestnut, you know, the attacks on the left is un-American, were trotted out. And I remembered, and I'm sure we'll see this in the next hour, that in 1952, at the height of the McCarthy period, the nation published several special issues. In fact, Henry Wallace was part of one or two of them. One was called How Free is Free. And Time Magazine published Richard Rovere, I think he was a New Yorker writer, who said that the issue must be, quote, causing cheers, provoking cheers in the Kremlin. And it is that kind of talk that I think has so congealed and stilled an important I'd call it an alternative, not a marginalized, but an alternative narrative in history and story about America. And I, I do believe that the media, and certainly history, has one of the great powers, which is to define reality, not in a manipulative way, not in the manufacturing of consent, but in explaining to people what are the ideas that matter, what are the, what are the ideas you have not heard, what are the views that need to be defined and listened to, because if people don't hear those, they will not understand that there is a different America and a different world that could be imagined. And I think and I hope that people watching this film will, will find in the retrieval, for example, of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's words, which are often, and I think if he were alive today, some of what he said, for example, the Economic Bill of Rights, he'd be driven out of Washington, D.C. But this is not a, a communist past. This is a rebel, American, radical, indigenous past that you have retrieved 
in the in this film. I would simply add one thing as the film uh, last hour we just saw. As Oliver and Peter know so well, journalism and history became casualties in the Cold War. And you lost the independent critical mind of thought that is so crucial to a democracy. One thing we tried to do at the nation was bring into our pages many of the historians who wrote about the bomb and who provided the truth in an alternative way of thinking about when, what happened in that period. And I, last thing I would say is that the power, I thought, of learning about Jimmy Burns, learning about Leslie Groves, I'm not sure that they can be attributed with all evil, because I think there are major structural forces that underlay some of what they did. But it is important to know that such people existed, to know that the convention of 1944, even though I have to say it was quite spirited compared to some of the scripted conventions we live with today, was such a critical one. But to also know, and I know Peter, this is so central to your work, the extraordinary conscience of the scientists, the extraordinary dissenting role that they tried to play late. I mean, Albert Einstein wrote in our pages in 1932 calling for the Sonderman Conference. But what he did in 39, and so many of the other scientists so deeply regretted. My last point, having spent many years going to Moscow, where this World War II is the last in a way unifying history that country has as they fight over Stalin. What Oliver and Peter have done is a great service because there are people in classrooms around this country who, thanks to Steven Spielberg, Tom Hanks, and with all respect to the late Stephen Ambrose, receive a history that is about how America won World War II. And America lost too many. It was terrible. But the Soviet Union and the numbers who were killed, the 27 million, which Gorbachev has spoken of, which you used as a figure, was an extraordinary, extraordinary sacrifice. And if we don't learn that history, we will never find a true way, first of all, to find non-military ways to deal with conflict, mm -hmm. but to respect other countries and to have that empathy, which you spoke of and speak to in this film. Thank you, Katrina. Uh, first off, um, guys, congratulations on both the documentary and the book. They have their book. I would like to see the book. Um, the, I have many impressions, and it's a powerful looking watching it three hours like this. Um, I certainly have asked your learn question. I learned Oliver likes Henry Wallace and doesn't like Harry Truman a whole lot. <laughs> And I think that that's going to be being talked about quite a bit. But I, we, I also want to thank Showtime for having the courage to run all of this. <laughs> but, you know, my thing that haunts me from it, and it's maybe because I've always, you know, we've been brought up to believe in uh, that Harry Truman was, um, you know, many people, that the bomb was a good thing, that it saved American lives going to the Japanese mainland that if he didn't drop those bombs, our boys would have lost lives. And that's powerful out there. I think around 70% of the American public feels that to be the truth. And it's been a great, uh, um, you know, part of the why Truman has become a near great president. He's ranked on many polls, number fifth or sixth presidents. Um, and I think this film uh, gives Truman a real comeuppance. It's, um, it, I think Oliver is making us rethink what occurred in 44 and what a fatal um, a moment that was when Henry Wallace did not get to be vice president anymore. And maybe it was FDR's fault for areas in San Diego not making his way to the convention, seeming uh, 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 Lord only knows what, what health problems he was plagued with at any given moment. Um, but there was a, to leave that open and just allow somebody like uh, Truman with so little experience to come in and not be informed on the Manhattan Project and not really understand the spirit of Yalta and to come in in a sense of wanting to um, overcompensate um, and that, you know, when people tell you well, you're going to be decisive, I'm a decider, I do things, I don't lose sleep over them, I worry about that. Uh, I worry about a personality that doesn't lose sleep over dropping bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki on the only time in world history a nuclear weapon is being used. Uh, in other words, I think one of the things that I, Oliver's made me rethink, because I'm a big fan of um, David McCullough and his Truman book and Robert Donovan's biographies of Truman and Alonzo Hamby, 
But I'm really having to rethink as a scholar and as a citizen um, whether we were correct to have dropped those bombs, um, to have done that at that time in, um, in Japan. And I think Oliver's work more than any I've seen lately is starting to make, um, you're starting to, I think, have a lot of scholars have been saying this, but Oliver's taking it into the public sphere. Um, you know, in my field, I did my doctorate in diplomatic history, and we, you have, um, we used to, a group of school of revisionists, you know, and you deal with revisionist historians all the time, and Walter Lefebvre, Howard Zinn, this work reminds me of, I'm sure if, if Howard was around, he would be applauding them. This film, and it's important that we don't get sold just a stale history um, of events. And this, in, and I'm concerned as I grow older and have three kids about the moral implications of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And wasn't there another way to do it? And the most compelling part of the way Oliver presents it for me is that notion that if we cut a deal to keep Emperor Hirohito in sooner, um, maybe in the spring of '45. Um, a lot of this could have been avoided. That's one thing we need to think about. And the second is, um, the, well, you know, what this anxiousness of, of um, keeping the Soviet Union out of the war against Japan. Now, this is not untold history. It's out there in re revisionist literature. Um, but I've had the advantage, which a lot of the audience have, of having to read their book. And I call it, a, in a, many ways, a left-wing Primer. It's in this William Appleman Williams school of thought, but it's very, very solidly researched and done. Now, one could argue that some sides are missing. You know that that uh, if the Truman acolytes had gone so far in, in creating the buck stops here, give them hell, Harry, um, that this goes in some ways demonizes um, Truman in some ways, and Truman's a complicated legacy we have to deal with. I mean. Um, you know, every, every the, the number, for example, on issues of race, he's the one who ended up integrating the armed forces of the United States, um, not Franklin Roosevelt. Um, and then one other point in the in the film that interests me a lot is this is the mystique around Henry Wallace and what you know. Did I don't have an answer to it, but I'd love to hear what either of you think um, as we go moving. Did Henry Wallace? Uh, in, in that FDR relationship, you know, they used to say about FDR, he was a chameleon on plaid and changed colors to everybody, but he never let his right hand know what his left hand was doing. And other people have called him the juggler. I'm wondering if his not, if he let, purposely just let Henry Wallace die on the vine in 44. Uh, there is a, Wallace had caused a lot of internal friction in the Roosevelt administration, particularly with Harold Ickes, who um, ended up having a huge feud with Wallace, and Ickes is the longest serving Secretary of Interior in U.S. history. In fact, Ickes wanted to create a Department of Conservation and take forestry and put it into interior. And there are all these uh, Washington bureaucratic battles. And there's some evidence FDR was getting tired of the, of the, the burden of Henry Wallace. Um, as somebody who admires Wallace so much, I, I think it was a mistake. It would have been better to have had Wallace in, in 44, and particularly the thought of Truman, with it, you ha, it does cause us to wonder about FDR's sense of grandiosity, that he is turning, he is so careless about who's going to be vice president when his own health is deteriorating so rapidly, and doesn't want to take who would be his immediate successor into the fold. And uh, this film made me you know, rethink some of those um, premises. Well, first let me say that I think it's a wonderful moment for this uh, incredibly powerful and rich and provocative uh, series to come out uh, because it uh, arrives at a time when I think many of us are really uh, trying to figure out what the direction of the entire American system is, what the future of our constitutional democracy is, what the relationship of the economy of money and corporations to political power is. Uh, and all of that is kind of up for grabs and in need of interpretation and uh, reinterpretation. Uh, but one side of it that certainly hasn't got the attention that it deserves, but that it does get in this movie, is the national security or the military side of things. Because that is a colossal piece of any puzzle if you're trying to figure out what the direction of the United States is going to be now. So 
I think it's a wonderful moment for this to, to come out. Uh, but we're invited to uh, uh, mention things that we learned from this movie. One, obviously, uh, I didn't know about that convention of 1944. <laughs> Uh, much less did I expect that it was the hinge of human history. Uh, uh, but it's very interesting to see how that works from the, from the glimpse of it that we got in the film, because uh, I think in the context of the questions that we're preoccupied with now about the sort of systemic future of the country, here we see a relationship or a potential relationship, very deep and dramatic, between the domestic on the one side and the foreign policy on the other side. Uh, so really the idea is that a whole different foreign policy, maybe no bomb, this was explicit, explicitly suggested, maybe no Cold War, uh, and so forth, had uh, the United States, uh, had the convention chosen uh, Henry Wallace and had he then become president. Uh, but then comes the question which Douglas has already uh, alluded to, and that is, and I'd like to underscore that, I put an, another underlining, uh, under it there, and that is, uh, why was it that he was kicked off, dumped uh, from the ticket? It wasn't just that he wasn't chosen, he was actually dumped. And that really comes in two parts. And who were those party bosses, and what interest did they represent, and what domestic forces, and what were their motivations, and what was it at that time, after all there had been no Cold War so far, so they couldn't be reacting to that, so what was it, so what was the relationship again of the economic and the domestic uh, to the foreign. So that's number one. Finally, and very quickly, because uh, one could go on uh, indefinitely about this, uh, that's the very powerful section on the atomic bomb, with which I wholly agree. Uh, but I think the passage there that was most interesting to me and most unknown to me was the relationship of Nazi Germany to Japan uh, and their failure to coordinate setting the stage for the eventual Soviet entry into the war. So you really have two levels of unknown here. On the one side, it's that relationship among those two Axis countries. And the second, which is better known, at least in revisionist literature, which is really becoming mainstream literature historically, and that is the really critical importance of the Soviet invasion uh, for the defeat of Japan, which is something that becomes more historically secure and uh, accepted with, with every uh, year that passes. Uh, my comment about that, though, goes back to what my, my suggestion that we're really having to rethink the, the American system. And, and in order to do that, I think it's obviously critically important to get our past right. Uh, and obviously, a key event, the key event, I don't know, I, I could make that argument uh, in America, in recent American history of the last, uh, you know, 65, 67 years was the use of the atomic bomb. Certainly the United States at that point crossed a, a moral uh, uh, point beyond which there was no turning back. Who was it in the movie who said that, uh, Peter? And who, who used that? Moral threshold. The moral threshold. Someone refers to it as a moral threshold. Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer. Stimson. 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 Thank you very much. And surely it was that. Uh, my own view is that whether or not the bomb was used to end the war or to intimidate the Soviet Union, we unquestionably crossed that threshold. And I think that in any thinking about the future of the United States, we have to take into account the deep and long influence that that acceptance of this instrument of unparalleled destruction has had upon us. Because since that day, we've really said to ourselves and to the world, we can't get rid of this, we can't get out of this trap, and therefore we now live in a civilization that actually depends crucially and irreparably on being able to utterly destroy that same civilization. That's a whole new moral equation for the United States and for the world. I'd add that, uh, you know, General Grove said that uh, he thought that Truman didn't so much make a decision and failed to uh, uh, cancel one, and I agree with that also, about 80%, although there were elements of a decision there. Uh, but what I'd add is that we as a country have not yet made that uh, decision either in regard to nuclear weapons, and we're still thinking it over. And until we do, uh, I, I don't think we're going to get ourselves in here. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.
Peter and Oliver, can you respond to what you've just heard? Sure. Thank you all for, for those illuminating comments. Uh, we're working on the assumption that people's view of history shapes their behavior in the present. That people's understanding of history actually not only shapes, but it also can limit the ways they think about the present, the way they think about the possibility for change. So one of the things we're trying to develop is that history did have to be the way it was, that our history didn't have to turn out the way it was, that we actually came very close to having a very different kind of history. We want to get people, give people the ability to think in a utopian fashion again. And I think that's been missing. Most of my students and other people we talk to think that <coughs> Things could have been a little bit different, but they don't have a sense of how profoundly different this country and our history could have been. So we're trying to challenge that. We're up against a couple basic problems, challenges. One is uh, that people tend to be very ignorant about our history. The a national report card was issued in June of 2011, and they reported that the area in which the high school seniors know the least, they come in lowest, is in terms of U.S. history. So we have a lot of discussion about the fact that uh, American students can't do math, can't do science, but actually they're even weaker when it comes to their own history. 12% of high school seniors demonstrate a proficiency, according to this exam, in, in U.S. history. In the mic a little more, Peter Shepard. In, into the mic. So, so, uh, so we're, you're dealing with this question of fundamental ignorance, and the other side, is that to the extent people do know some history, they often know the wrong history. So that we're so they're filled with mythology. So we're, we're challenging, we're trying to educate people in a basic way. We're also trying to, to deal with the mythology, the, the wrong history that they've been taught in the schools. Uh, so far as some of the specific questions, uh, uh, the party bosses were intent upon getting rid of Wallace. They resented the fact that Roosevelt chose him in 1940. Wallace hadn't even become a Democrat until a few years before that. He was a Republican. His father was a Republican Secretary of Agriculture under Harding and Coolidge. So they didn't like that about him. Uh, and then, but Roosevelt, if you saw in that letter that we cite, that's a, a wonderful letter that Roosevelt writes in 1940, in which he says that the Democratic Party, that we already have one party that's dominated by Wall Street and financial interests and conservative, and if the Democratic Party is going to stand for anything, then it should stand for progressive values and social justice. And he's not even going to run if they're not going to stand for that. So, and he saw Wallace as the exemplar of the fight against fascism, the fight for democracy, and egalitarian progressive values. But the party bosses were kept from a different political persuasion. And in 1944, they were convinced that Roosevelt was not going to survive another term. And they wanted to get somebody on the ticket to replace Wallace who was not going to be so radical. Wallace's radicalism was widely known. His, his Sense Me the Common Man speech was a response to Henry Luce's speech uh, about the American century. So he was talking about it as anti-imperialist, anti-colonialist. He was the leading proponent for civil rights for African Americans, a leading proponent in the party for equal rights for, for women. Uh, so he, he was involved in this vision of social justice, and they were frightened by that. So they wanted to replace him with, with Truman, who was much more conservative. Oliver? Um, thank you for coming. Thank you for enduring. Mm -hmm. This is the most ambitious and complex project I've ever been involved in, I've ever done. <laughs> when I undertook this with Peter in the, actually uh, 2008, I never thought 10 hours would be so, so complex. I didn't know what I was in for. <laughs> But it started in 1997, actually, because uh, Peter and I had talked and we, I had commissioned him to write a screenplay for me about, about Henry Wallace because he told me this incredible story about these seven seconds or whatever, five feet, whatever Claude Pepper was a distance from the, from the platform. I said, that's a great movie. And of course, like all many great movies, it didn't get made. But 11 years later, we, we sat down and we said, let's do something about uh, the bomb which was uh, Peter's uh, expertise is in the bomb, and he teaches uh, the bomb mostly, and among other things, at American University. So that gave birth to a longer idea, because the concept of repetition kicks in. It's 
all the, what you saw in these three hours, which is an amazing amount of, of events and patterns get set. And you don't see those patterns until you work the, until you do see the 10 hours and you understand the repetitions that occur. And we have to deal with that. But I think, Jonathan, you raised a very good point about what, what determines these events. Is there a, and I wondered this too, I mean, I keep asking Peter about what the hell happened to FDR? How could he, you know, what was in his mind? And we all wonder this. This is a very good question. What was in his mind? And uh, I do think a part of me accepts the, the fatigue and the personal decision and a certain disillusionment. But also, I do think we had the line where he says he thinks he's going to live. I do think that we, a certain, certain people believe in their immortality, or if you would say, they do have an ego, and they do think that they're going to make it. And I admire his will and his strength of character. And he probably said, I'm going to will myself to, to at least get this UN go, going in 19, at least 1946, I'm going to make it. You know, and then Truman maybe can't fuck it up so much. Maybe I'll teach Truman along the way, but a lot was happening from, you know, uh, from 44, late 44 to 45. I mean, I can't imagine his work schedule. Uh, Secondly, I would like to point out that for me, because it's, you know, we're, we're talking about revisionist history and many of you know about this, but the average student, uh, which my daughter, for example, is 7, 16, she, she learns the old history that I learned, uh, what I talked about, and she learns about the Cold War, and the Cold War is only about the, only about the Soviet domination of Eastern Europe in her book, and she's at a good school, so you see that there's a global perspective here, and this is very important. Uh, and I would say that the, what I learned, and it's all a learning curve for me, I'm still learning about Obama and Bush, and we're, not, we're on our last chapters as we're finishing here. But the British Empire plays a significant role in my understanding of World War II as a result of these three hours. I did not understand, and I'm very impressed with Roosevelt's line about, we're not going to be a good time Charlie, and all the things he says about the British Empire, he was truly, what, and we must not forget the legacy of World War I, which we mentioned, but we originally had two other chapters that were, foot, that were, were leading, that we cut back to, which was World War I and the 1930s, which set up, but that became a 12-hour movie, and unfortunately, for budget reasons, we did have to cut back. Enough of me, I thought we'd get into it, but just want to tell you a little bit about the framework. It's, it's not just these three hours, it is ten hours. How unusual was it for, I mean, Roosevelt clearly writes a letter saying, I want Henry Wallace as my running mate, and the party negates that. Is that like a monumental moment in party history? Did that happen all the time? In 44, you mean? Yeah. Uh, no, that's, that doesn't happen all the time. No, that's, that is, a, but the party conventions were very different in 44 than they are now. And they were controlled by the bosses which is a point we have to make about Roosevelt's decision in 44. The bosses came to him on several occasions, sat down with him for hours, saying, we have to get Wallace off the ticket. We need to replace him with somebody else. So he was under a lot of pressure from the bosses during that time. He was getting weaker, and he said to them, basically, I can't do this campaign by myself. You guys have to run the campaign, because I don't have my usual strength. And so he deferred to them. But among the people who are angriest with him for this, was Eleanor Roosevelt and all of the Roosevelt children. They all championed Wallace, and they said to him explicitly, this is what you've stood for. You and Wallace are a team, you've stood for this progressive vision, and you're going to choose Harry Truman now? So it was for several years that Eleanor and the other children were very upset with Franklin for having uh, made this decision. But again, that's behind the scenes. The fact that there was a published, I mean, did people not know about this letter? that we hear in the film? No, no, he never issued the letter. He never issued sure, it. That makes it clear to me. Yeah. Katrina? I mean, again, I, I will see to no one in my admiration for Franklin Delano Roosevelt, but he was a <laughs> politician. I mean, he was someone who believed in bold but persistent experimentation. And there's the famous line, but no one can find it in the archives at Hard Park, where either Francis Perkins or Sidney Hillman or uh, Philip Randolph come to him and say, do this, do this, do that, and he says, go out and make me do it. I mean, in one way, I think this is the people's untold history, but it's very different in my mind than the Howard Zinn work, because it's more about the division and the establishment, the possibilities when establishments divide, when you see alternatives that leaders can build on. With the exception of Dorothy Day, or your great reference to the strikes, how militant the labor movement was during World War II, maybe it comes later. But the ability of social movements in our country's history to push 
leaders, to push politicians, to push titans of finance beyond the limits of their politics to build a more just and fair country is interesting to me. I would pick up on what Jonathan said in Oliver to a certain extent. It's not, this comes at a very important time because there is a kind of crisis not only of our politics and economy, but of spirit in the sense that our history is, the demand is so often for our history to be self-congratulatory and not self-critical. And this idea that there is a new American exceptionalism, it's not new. We see it in the parameters of the films we've just seen. So I think that's so important, and I think the hope it can give. I disagree with Peter a little. I don't think it's utopian. I think there is a realism in here that there is an alternative path that people can seize, that leaders can be pushed to take. And I think of Norman Thomas, who's a magazine, Nation <coughs> magazine endorsed in 1932, until we endorsed Franklin Delano Roosevelt three times. Um, what he said once was, uh, I am a supporter, I am not a supporter of lost causes. I am a supporter of causes not yet won. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's something in that spirit mm -hmm. that should animate us, for example, when we see the squandered opportunity that Mikhail Gorbachev and Ronald Reagan, of all people, in Reykjavik, which Jonathan has written so eloquently about in the context of the abolition of nuclear weapons, an important cause of our time, that that opportunity was squandered. Or that a George Kennan who wrote the great letter, or not so great letter, about containment of the Soviet Union, was one of the key opponents of the NATO expansion, which in my mind in the post-Cold War world has been one of the greatest disasters in terms of its modern um, yeah, Well, wonderful comments, Katrina. I wanted to ask Oliver, um, you know, first off, this, in, this month in New York, that Roosevelt Island here is becoming a park for FDR overlooking the United Nations, so it's quite exciting and, uh, and there's also, you know, people are, are getting, Katrina's father has been really the main person uh, behind getting that island done. One of the things I like about this film is that Oliver, and it took um, heroes, so it made us remember what was great about Franklin Roosevelt and Henry Wallace, they're really the white hats, and then you have the black hats in many ways, Truman and um, Jimmy Burns, but the one part of it, you could, Aubrey said it's global. Were you concerned that when you brush over, like when we deal with Stalin, we say, well, but he was monstrous, but we're not really seeing the purges, or when you're dealing with Japan, not dealing with the rape of Nanking, but yet we see the Japanese internment camps in America, but not the way maybe American POWs are being treated by Japan. Um, how is that, you know, do you guys find, are you worried that that's a weakness in the film, that you're not focusing uh, on that, or it's just impossible in a frame of time? Well, two, two things. First is the unfold history of the United States. So we're focusing on the history of the American Empire. But he said global, and while for many of us it was global, this is global history for the first, you know, instead of... The main focus, the history of the American Empire and the, and the national security state is the main focus. We actually do talk about the rape of Nanjing. Uh, we do talk about the rape of Nanjing. Uh, we do talk about some of the things that, that you were mentioning. It's just not the main focus. We talked about the Bataan Death March and the horrors of the treatment of the American POWs by the Japanese. So we, we touch on those issues. We can't focus on them as much as we would like to focus. Because even though there's a lot of information here, you would be astounded by how much we had to take out to get these down to 58 minutes. That's why we have an 800 plus page book that goes along with it. And even that, we had to cut out 200 pages because there's so much to say about all of these topics. Yeah. Well, we'll show you the book. The book goes on sale. You know, Susie, do you have a copy? Can you just bring it down here? Please? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I it is. I mean, we, we, I thought when I saw it today, because I haven't seen chapter two, that we, get, we went a long way on Poland and we went a long way at using a lot of the conservative attack on Russia, because I heard it so often as a child. My father was definitely uh, in that camp. I grew up with the shadow of And all these accusations against uh, Russia were, that were evident back then. That's why we went into some depth with Yalta, and quite a lot of depth, I thought, on Poland, maybe too much for some people. But because we were sensitive to those issues, but when you look at the whole global story about the U.S. acquisition of new bases starting in 1945, 6, and the growth, and you see the, the other pressures on the Soviet Union included its own devastation, that's what 
You have to keep a global, what I meant is a global perspective on the pressures on that. It's not just about Eastern Europe. It's about the whole damn thing. Okay. I think we can perhaps open it up to some questions. I see a lot of hands already. Uh, yes, gentlemen, over here. Uh, hold on, was Mike. We have a uh, mic. Wasn't there a movement in 44 to William O'Dellis on the ticket? Wasn't there a movement in 44 to William O'Dellis on the ticket? Was there a movement in 44 to put William O'Douglas on the ticket? Yes, Douglas was uh, one of the possibilities who was considered. And he didn't have Wallace's appeal, and he also had a lot of Wallace's baggage. He was considered to be too liberal by the party bosses. You have to remember, these are very conservative people, the party bosses. They didn't want, Douglas was much too liberal for them, and Wallace was much to the left of O'Douglas. I just have one thing. There is some evidence that it was even on a, a piece of paper that FDR wanted Douglas, and it got the Truman's name came up in the forward of it. So Douglas is uh, invoked in that, and he, I think, would have been a very good president when about Douglas. He went on not only to be our country's longest Supreme Court justice in U.S. history, but on issues of the environment. Um, he, there was nobody um, in our country in the Cold War era who was more concerned about. Uh, Raining in chemical pollution, uh, uh, effects of, of nuclear testing, and things than William O. Douglas. In fact, it was Douglas who pioneered to help Rachel Carson do Silent Spring, um, which uh, about DDT and other pesticides, which is right now having its 50, 50 years of Silent Spring. But like Henry Wallace, William O. Douglas were these great new dealers and a uh, great generation of people that FDR allowed in his government which made um, all things Franklin Roosevelt quite exciting in the 30s and 40s. Uh, I'd like to respond to one of the points that uh, Doug Brinkley made before, because it's an interesting one that I don't think is entirely valid. <laughs> you're, you're, you're suggesting that we've got good guys and bad guys, and that it, almost in an unmitigated sense, mm. uh, and that Truman is one of our villains. Uh, I don't think we're demonizing Truman uh, in the sense that you're suggesting. Will you show this at the Truman Library? <laughs> I love it. Yes, yes. You won't be invited, I promise you. I, I'd love to yeah, be invited. Yeah, the the most beloved historian in America, and the, they, they carry a huge constituency with them, so this is well, not appropriate. There's nothing positive about Truman. Well, uh, we've been trying to contextualize him. For example, the fact that uh, he was vice president for 82 days, during which time he met with Roosevelt twice. If, uh, and talk about nothing of substance, uh, when, when Truman did not even find out that we were building an atomic bomb. The people that had such little regard for him, nobody even told him we were building an atomic bomb until after Roosevelt died. And, and then that night, Truman learns about this. Uh, Truman was in a terribly difficult position. We don't uh, envy him or simply castigate him. He was a, a, in way over his head, which he told everybody, and he was had to face the most difficult, complex issues in the world. And so but we're, we're sympathetic to Truman. But Truman's one of the most popular presidents in American history. And he's popular for doing a whole bunch of things. I mean, for working with the creation of NATO, for um, working with for the creation of Israel. Oh. For, well, I mean, he is ranked as the top in the United States. Truman's one of the for reasons. He was uh, successfully dealt with the Berlin blockade in 48. He helped reorder or living in Harry Truman, Truman's national security state, and, and for better or for worse, with the Pentagon, Air Force, and National Security Council, Joint Chiefs of Staff, and we go on and on and on. Truman accomplished a lot, and there's a reason why so many people like Harry Truman. I'm just suggesting, I'm an, uh, an FDR person, but I'm just suggesting this film where you're going to get people talking about it is going to be your tough on Truman. There's not, an, uh, the only opening you're giving him is he was a naif. And, and many people say he was a very decisive and, and important, hugely important president. Maybe most people think um, Truman did many of the things correctly. I'm not saying I do, but his, his stock is sky high. But Doug, this is close, this is chapter four, and we are going to, but you know, this is, we are showing that there's not, nothing wrong, there's no facts that are wrong. Yeah, no. Uh, I mean, if you've done something noble, believe me, we're not looking to cut it out. You don't see it. Well, I mean, he's correct. The nobleness, the nobleness, <laughs> this is very well. The nobleness for people would be that he won World War II, that he'd be defeated Germany, 
in Japan. That's why people, well, I mean, he's considered a successful commander. So there's something different than actually having done it. We show the, how it was done, and we show the Roosevelt Stalin policy. I don't know that Truman deserves credit for, the, uh, for winning the war in Japan. I don't. By the way, this is the book. I just want to thank Simon and Schuster, who also is here tonight. Simon and Schuster and Showtime have played a huge role in this. And this is uh, on October 30th. All the way at the back there, the side. Yeah. Um, Strong, I, I went to the same high school you did. Um, and so I can confirm that while the bulk of what was in the program, uh, I think we were taught, we were lucky to have gone to a particularly good school, certainly the importance of the 44 Convention uh, was not. The um, 44 Convention and the courses I took there were just sort of passed over uh, uh, very quickly. We knew about, uh, about what happened. So can you tell me about the process by which you discovered or realized or whatever, uh, how did you come about realizing how important the 44 Convention was? Well, it's, it's Peter's story. Uh, Peter had done, it's not my original scholarship. We've done some original scholarship in this and Peter should talk about it, but definitely it's a story that was new to me. I didn't learn much. I don't know what history classes you went to at that school. I remember the old school. And it was very good uh, for that time, but uh, none of this, none of this. I mean, we're, you're focusing on 44, but we had no impression of what we just saw. And neither does my daughter, and neither does my son. I mean, that, it just isn't taught yet. I mean, we've got to start somewhere with education to change the thinking. Uh, as to the 44 convention, uh, Oliver and I talked about this the first time we ever had dinner together in 1996 uh, as a pivotal turning point in history. It's astounding to me that the Gallup poll that was released on July 20th, the first night of the convention, 65% of potential voters said they wanted Wallace back as vice president. 2% said they wanted Harry Truman. Uh, so, I mean, what does this say about, about our country and, and democracy even then? It's been narrowed further in recent years, uh, but that's a pivotal turning point, as is the, the fact that uh, that uh, Claude Pepper was not five feet from the microphone. If he'd gotten those five more feet, we're suggesting, all of history would have been different. We can't tell for sure how it would have been different, but we know certain things. We know he was the leading opponent of the nuclear arms race for the next year and a half, or even longer than that. We, we know he was the leading opponent of the Cold War. If you see our next episode, We've got very much about Wallace's critique of the Cold War. And what he says between 44 and 48 is spot on. And he understood those issues in a way that almost nobody else, in our opinion, understood them in the United States. And he fought. The thing is, we, we don't have the time to tell the whole story here, but he battled Truman every step of the way between April 45, when Truman became president, and September 46, when Wallace was ousted. He wasn't passive or quiet about it. He was meeting with Truman repeatedly over that time. And among the things that concerned him, as Jonathan knows, was that Leslie Grove had complete control over the atomic bomb. It was Wallace who forced Truman to take the control of the bomb out of uh, Leslie Grove's hands, because Leslie Grove was actually talking about the possibility of a preemptive strike against the Soviet Union in, in late 1945. So as we say there, uh, that Wallace considered Groves to be a fascist and was very frightened by that. And Wallace managed to control and contain some of the militarism and the most egregious aspects of our Cold War confrontation policy when he was in the cabinet until Truman finally fired him. But quickly, I just add, because I think it's, when I saw it today, one of the most poignant moments was for me, uh, two moments was, when Leslie Groves, the comment that he makes about Truman had nothing to do with that he did not interfere, Doug mentioned that, that he was a, a boy on the toboggan, <laughs> indicates that there, was a, that there was a process which he raised. There was a process. And we point to it a bit with some, and it comes into play with Forrestal in chapter four with the Wall Street crowd, but we talk about the Wall Street background and the anti-communist the anti attitude that goes back to mm -hmm. World War. One and of course the Wilson intervention in in Russia is mentioned briefly. Unfortunately, we covered it in more detail. But there are strong pre-Soviet roots for this uh, 
uh, uh, for this whole rivalry and Harriman and and, uh, and uh, Harriman is, is an embodiment of as well as so many other people are. But there is a process and we don't know what panel of groves is saying. And number two, the most beautiful moment for me, seeing it again, is to hear those lines about Roosevelt's death, but they do apply to 1944, which is to, f uh, to fail is, is not tragic. To be human is. One thing that struck me beyond all the stuff of, of Truman and his place is whether or not the decision to drop the atomic bomb was justified. Do you have any sense of what percentage of Americans today would believe that that decision was absolutely justified? Is it almost universal? No, so that was something I was, I was taught growing up. There have been a number of surveys over the years. First of all, we say in there that immediately afterwards, 85% of the public supported the dropping of the bomb. We did mention there that 23% of the public said they wished the Japanese had not surrendered so quickly so we could have dropped more atomic bombs on them. 30% in the Southwest. So, I mean, we have to understand the mindset. We try to convey a little bit of the mindset that the Americans had during this time. Uh, in recent surveys, it's usually about 65 to 35, or some, some of them are a little closer than that. So, you know, I, no, let me change that. It's more like 55, 45 in the most recent ones. It, but what we found is that the older generation is much more supportive of the atomic bombing. Younger, uh, younger generation and, and women are much more opposed to atomic bombing. So we're moving in the right direction in terms of... And one of the things that we're proudest of is episode three, because I think we're going to challenge the basic narrative about, about that and the whole decision to drop the bomb. Jonathan, thoughts about that? Uh, <laughs> You know, one very peculiar result of the new historical research is the emphasis on the Soviet invasion. Sorry, uh, the emphasis on the Soviet uh, invasion of Manchuria as the decisive element. And you, the movie uh, refers to briefly the reason for that, which was the Japanese have been thinking about it. They've been facing really defeat, and their one idea, or really fantasy was that the Soviet Union was going to step in on their side. So they were versed in it. They were used to this idea. So when the Soviets came in, it dashed dreams. So it had an immediate psychological effect. Whereas with the bomb, it's very surprising to learn, and it's something that has an implication for the whole future of nuclear policy, which is that the actual use twice of the bomb did not you can't, it's very difficult to find a record of the devastating effect of that psychologically on Japanese leaders. And in as much as uh, nuclear policy ever since has been based on the idea of deterrence, which is based precisely on the idea of such a psychological effect, uh, this historical passage, which, as I say, is strengthened uh, with every year that goes by, becomes more and more important. I know how important Vietnam has been in all of his work in life, but I was struck seeing... Mike? I was struck... I know how important Vietnam has been in Oliver Stone's work in, in life, but seeing Curtis LeMay and then the terror bomb, and thinking of William... seeing William Shire as well, who wrote so brilliantly about the rise of the Third Reich and about the bombings of that, that, that period, but during the Vietnam years, he wrote for the nation, looking at just the square, raw, horrific tonnage of bombing during World War II on one day as compared to the bombing in Cambodia and Laos and how later it exceeded. So I'm just thinking that there are roots in what we see here that will be important in unfolding into the Vietnam period and beyond for a new generation. And as, as you know, Katrina, we dropped more bombs on Vietnam than we dropped in all previous warfare by all countries in history on that tiny little country of Vietnam. So where the Rubicon of morality is, is one to raise this. Lots of questions. Okay, uh, yes, so. <coughs> In terms of uh, whether the atomic bombs didn't really influence Japan is to surrender as much as we thought, I'll ask the historian in the panel, the contents of Hirohito's uh, surrender speech to the nation I know that he mentioned the atomic bomb. Did he also mention the Russian entry in the war in that same speech? I don't recall Did myself. Did mention the Russian entry into Manchuria in his uh, surrender speech? Hirohito issues three rescripts 
uh, to after the war ended. One he mentions the atomic bomb and not the Russian invasion. One he mentions the Soviet invasion and not the atomic bomb. And one he mentions both. Which one was so I, hmm? Which one went on the radio? The first one was the one that he mentions the atomic bomb. And not the Russian Right. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, you mentioned uh, chapter four. I'd be interested in you briefly characterizing the other seven <laughs> chapters. <laughs> Just what they are. But also a question. You have finished a book, but is the series finished? And is chapter 10, have you blocked picture or are you leaving it open until a certain time? <laughs> Question, I'm sorry, the question is, could Oliver Pratt briefly and Peter talk about the other chapters, the other seven chapters, and give us an outline of where this series is going? Just briefly say that a picture is being locked on 9 and 10 and final text. It's not that we're waiting for the election, because I think we're <laughs> into a really big picture, but it's really about pure work and effort. And of course, these, 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 these drafts are redone constantly. We are constantly checking ourselves, and there's a lot of fact-checking going on. So 9 and 10 are still, and th that's the Bush and Obama years, yes. And that we're doing now. Peter, will address your other six chapters. <laughs> <laughs> what we do is we take it all the way up to the present, up to today. We're constantly adding, we're talking about drones, we're talking about the Asian pivot. As, as you might know, Hillary Clinton wrote an article in Foreign Policy magazine this year in which it's titled America's Pacific Century when we're talking about our pivot to Asia which is our containment policy toward China and is a policy that's involved with shifting our fleet from 50-50 Pacific Atlantic to uh, 60% now in Asia uh, that, that we're militarizing, we've got these military agreements, we're setting up new bases in that region and we've got, a, a, as Thomas Johnson said, an empire of bases. The United States, we don't know how to count them because they're defined differently. We might have a thousand bases. How many bases does China, our main antagonist, have now? They just got their first base. So, uh, so this, this is what we're up against. And, and so we're trying to take this story about American militarism and the wars, as Katrina was saying, right up to the present. So we deal in, in depth with... Iraq and Afghanistan, and we're ta telling aspects of those wars that the public doesn't know. And we're, so we're, we're discussing Obama, and Obama is for us a, an interesting case study, because it shows how difficult it is for somebody that intelligent, with a certain kind of decency and morality, how difficult it is for even Obama to break with these patterns that we're seeing. So in some ways we're critical of Obama, not in the same way we'd be critical of Romney, which is you know, a whole other nightmare. <laughs> but, but in, in terms of the limitations on somebody like Obama, who hopefully would like to make changes, and he was warned about these things. He met with historians when he first took office, and they went around, and they all said to him, the one thing you can't do is get involved in Afghanistan. So that's the biggest mistake you can make. And of course, and with uh, Robert Gates and Hillary Clinton, you look at the people who surround themselves with Jones, it's not surprising, given the, his advisors on the, the Rubenites on domestic policy and economic policy, and the Clintonites on, and Gates, even worse, on foreign policy. So we take it up to the president. Yes, ma'am, right here. Uh, uh, I was wondering, I've been asking around uh, people here in America about uh, Smedley Butler, mm -hmm. and I haven't met a single person, including history teachers, who have heard of him. Mm -hmm. I've traveled also to Chicago, and I couldn't see the general, the most decorated general, who wrote uh, War is a Racket. So I was wondering, also in Hollywood, I've never seen a film about Smedley Butler, not that I'm aware of it. How many people have heard of Smedley Butler? Raise your hand. Okay, I've seen I've seen I was wondering if you are planning on doing something, if you do, I will work for free on the research. We, we, uh, we're two years over budget and two uh, years over we, our due date. We, we did two chapters about uh, 1900 and 1920 to 19. 40. Butler was very much a hero, and uh, those two chapters are right now are footnotes because of time and energy. But he was a great. Uh, he died in 1939, and he was 
interesting character. You know. we, we had all of that about Butler, and we, we had about his becoming such a fierce opponent of, of warfare. We had about his critique of the U.S. policy in Latin America. We also had about his critique of the businessman's plot right. in 1934, 1935. Stories that very, very few Americans know about. We've got great information. It's in the book. And, and hopefully we'll get to release those other two episodes with the box set, if we can. Yeah, thank you so much for a very provocative series. It's obviously going to raise hell around the country. And I want to push back on the third segment and the second segment. The second segment, I think, doesn't do justice to the complexities of the Polish question, the way you frame it in there. Because you started, you sort of ignore from 39 to 42 to the death of Sikorsky, and then started with this comment of Stalin saying, the terror of the Poles. Yet we're not, the, the sort of ambiguity of what occurs between in the Allies is sort of lost to that. So we sort of get the impression that when he imposes the Lublin government, well, that's his point of view, right on. He has to do it because he perceives them as terrorists. First critique. Second critique, in the third segment, you don't include the coup. The coup that the Japanese military planned between Hiroshima and Nagasaki to overthrow the government because they didn't want peace. And that, of course, is a fact, not an interpretation. So I just wanted you to respond to those two. It's a great piece. It's going to cause tremendous debate. And Doug and Jonathan saying how it's good to frame and rethink what's been going on for the past 15 years. They're going to accomplish that. Everybody heard that? Uh, questions about, first, the, the whole Polish question. Uh, in the film, it basically 